Hello and welcome to the How To Carnivore podcast. I'm your host, Simon Lewis, and you're tuning into the Plant Free MD series with Dr. Anthony Chafee. Dr. Chafee is a surgeon, nutritional researcher, and former pro rugby player. He's been strict carnivore for three years and an on and off carnivore for more than 20. Dr. Chafee looks and feels like a real life superhero. If losing fat, building muscle, finding focus, and getting the most out of life is important to you, you're going to love the Plant Free MD series. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode with the Plant Free MD, Dr. Anthony Chafee. Today, the topic is diabetes. This is an extremely important one because I've just done a little bit of Googling and one in 20 Australians suffer from diabetes and one in 10 Americans suffer from diabetes. So that's 10% of the population. And uh, a little bit more Googling, some of the common symptoms of early stage type 2 diabetes, uh, blurred vision, poor wound healing, yeast infections, a lot of hunger, a lot of thirst, a lot of really unpleasant side effects and symptoms. So uh, Dr. Chafee, welcome. I'm looking forward to diving into diabetes with you. Yeah, thanks, man. Me too. Cool. So uh, just to set the scene um, for the slow ones like myself, um, what, what is diabetes? So, so there's a few different kinds of diabetes, but traditionally uh, they're referred to as you know type one diabetes, type two diabetes, um, and um, so type one diabetes is used to be called juvenile diabetes because we you know, we generally saw this in the young, and this is when your body stops producing insulin for some reason. It's thought to be um, uh, possibly autoimmune, possibly uh, your body after a viral infection has that's called molecular mimicry where your body has has antibodies towards something um, like a virus or, or, or some other sort of pathogen. And then that's close enough to these beta islet cells in your pancreas that make insulin that it attacks those as well. So that's sort of what we're thinking now, um, but we're not 100% sure. So is, uh, is so to interrupt, is type one diabetes, is that caused by lifestyle or uh, is that sort of something generally outside of people's control? Um, it's thought to be outside of people's control. It's thought to be, uh, you know, through molecular mimicry or some sort of autoimmune uh, issue. But obviously, you know, as I've, I've, you know, we've spoken about and I've spoken about on my you know, autoimmune uh, uh, episode, um, it's, it's possible that autoimmune issues can be precipitated by uh, environment as well. And so the things that we eat and the things that we do can help stop that. Now, once, once your body has attacked your beta islet cells for whatever reason uh, that, that they're generally thought to be gone. Uh, however, there's, uh, there are some studies in animal models showing that that, that might actually be able to be reversed uh, actually through diet as well and diet and fasting called a fasting mimicking diet, which we can get to um, just as the, just to, to finish with the, the definitions type two diabetes is uh, pre was pre previously called adult onset diabetes in the mouth in the 1990s, you had a bunch of kids getting adult onset diabetes. And, and so they had to rename it instead of actually thinking for half a second and realizing that something was going on that, that was causing this. So type two diabetes is traditionally thought of as, as peripheral insulin resistance. So you have years and years and years of eating too many carbohydrates and sugar, drinking alcohol, and this you know, sets in motion, you're having high blood sugar all the time and your body needs more and more insulin and, and it, you're, you actually get peripheral insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, where the high insulin levels are actually causing harm in your body. High blood sugar is causing harm in your body by, you know, direct damage by glycating uh, and glycosylation uh, to various molecules. So over the years, you develop peripheral insulin resistance, and now you need more and more insulin to get the same result, just like any sort of you know, drug, uh, drug uh, tolerance issue. Uh, you know, you need more and more and more to get the same, same sort of result. And so eventually they might need to get, go on insulin as well. That is more thought to be more lifestyle and that you can manage this with uh, diet and exercise but it's still thought to be a progressive disease that this only gets worse. It doesn't get better, but of course, in the carnivore community, we actually see this absolutely reversing people coming off their oral medications, coming off um, the massive doses of insulin um, and at least coming down to a, a minimal dose of insulin, which is also what we're seeing 
in uh, type one community as well, their blood sugars are much easier to control because their, their body's making the exact amount of blood sugar that they need. They're not having these big swings because of what they're eating and have to take fast acting uh, insulins. They can just take their low dose background level of insulin. And because their body's producing constant levels of blood sugar and uh, glycogen, that that's all you need. You don't need these, these breakthrough medications and these fast, fast acting insulins. Sure. So carnivore has been shown to help with both type one and type two. Is that kind of what you're alluding to there? Yeah. Well, it's cer certainly in symptom management. Okay. And, and certainly in uh, progression and the amount of medications that you need. So, so for type one, it's major benefit that we're seeing now is that it gets people on a minimal dose of insulin and they don't need to use all the fast acting uh, insulins. And that, you know, you can get very difficult uh, situations where you get hypo, hypo, um, uh, hypoglycemic and you'll have, you know, drops and you, these are, these are dangerous. You can die from this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're toying around with your, your insulin all day and people get very good at this and, and practiced at it. So, um, you know, issues can be kept to a minimum, but it's, it, you know, you do have to be very careful, and especially like, you know, teenagers and kids, they really don't like it. They don't like it. That they have to do this and they sort of rebel against it and say, well, I'm not going to do that. And they end up really hurting themselves. Um, with type two diabetes, it, it is actually reversing the disease process. Yeah. Wow. You know, and, and as I, you know, talk about in other things, that's, that's because, you know, these things aren't really diseases, they're actually toxicities. And so you're getting this toxic, um, byproducts, you know, these toxic sort of results of eating carbohydrates, eating sugar, drinking alcohol, and that, that toxicity manifests as what we call type two diabetes. Okay. So you remove the toxin, the toxicity goes away. And so that's what we see, uh, this sort of, um, reversible, uh, situation. Okay. So mm -hmm. when you remove all that and you go to a carnivore diet and you remove all, you, know, you, you can even do it with a ketogenic diet, just, just no carbohydrates or sugar, or alcohol. Um, people, people recover very, very well. Their, their blood sugars stabilize their peripheral insulin resistance can actually start to reverse as well. And they come off their medications. They come down on their insulin if they're insulin dependent as well. You know, my mother is a, is a perfect example of that. She was a uh, type two diabetic for 25 years off and on good or bad control, mostly not the best. And her HbA1c, which is a marker of uh, how, how well you're doing and controlling your blood sugar over the course of three months uh, was fairly high. And she was on three oral medications and on a high dose of her background insulin because she was now insulin dependent because her, her pancreas had burnt out at that point. And two months on a high fat carnivore diet, she came off all three of her medications and reduced her insulin down to the minimal dose of uh, 14 units for Lantus. And her HbA1c went from 8.9, which is quite high, mm -hmm. down to 6.1, which is the upper limit of normal for a non-diabetic. Okay. And her doctors looked at her and said, how the hell did you do this? <laughs> what the hell did you do? Did she tell them? Yeah, she did. Yeah. But you know, her doctor saying like, look, this is, this is a, this is a progressive disease. This only gets worse. We can mitigate this and slow it down with diet and lifestyle and medication, but this only gets worse. This doesn't just go away. How the hell did you do this? And, you know, my, my mom told her, it's like, well, you know, Anthony's been doing a lot of research into this. He thinks that we're actually carnivores and that's the type of animal that we are. And when we eat outside of that, this is what's causing these problems. And, you know, just going into the whole, whole bit. And, you know, she said, you know, she was interested in that. And so I went in and, and spoke to her for like an hour and a half, you know, just sort of took over my mom's, uh, you know, so, so, so you went in and you went in and spoke doctor to doctor. Yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, you know, we just, we just spoke and, and ended up talking for like an hour and a half, you know, took up a lot of her time, but she was there, the, her and her PA were very, very interested in talking about all these sorts of things. And she, you know, she's a very bright lady. She's an MD PhD from Harvard. She has a PhD in biochemistry from Harvard. And I just said, it was like, look, you know, we're looking at biochemistry all wrong. You know, we call this a fed state and it's a fasting state. I, I completely disagree. I think the so-called fasting state is our primary metabolic state. That's where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear. This is the metabolic state of animals in the wild because they're all fat driven. They don't eat carbs. Wolves don't eat 
car, you know, carbo load before they chase caribou for 10 hours. And they, and they do great. We have studies going back to 1981, looking at wolves, checking their blood sugar, checking their glycogen. And it's just rock solid. The thought was at the time, you have to eat carbs to burn carbs. And they found out, well, no, actually you don't. And so, you know, the only reason that we call uh, one a fed state and the other a fasting state is because by the time we were able to look at, at our biochemistry at a molecular level, everyone was eating carbohydrates. So, you know, it was just natural. It said, oh, when you eat, it looks, your metabolism looks like this. And when you don't eat, it looks like this. It's like, yeah, but when you eat anything except carbohydrates, it also looks like this. And this is, again, where all of our heavy machinery come to bear. Our body starts making blood sugar, making glycogen, mm -hmm. making ketones. And, and it's very exacting. It's, it's so well controlled, like anything else we see in our body. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's very natural for me to look at that and be like, okay, that's, that makes sense that that's our natural state as opposed to an insulin driven state where that's blocking off all the mechanics of your, yeah, let's, let, let's, let's dig into this a little bit more so that, you know, your, your average person can understand. So you're sort of, uh, differentiating between a fed state and a fasted state and yeah. what other kind of indicators that we use for a fed state. And I'm, you know, I'm putting this in, um, in speech marks, because this is kind of a term that seems to have been you know, mm -hmm. invented to suit carbohydrate consumption. So what, what, what are kind of the markers of that? Well, so, um, and, and yeah, you're right. I mean, because that, that, that's everyone calls it, oh, this is a fed state that's fasting. And, and people that have taken biochemistry, people don't think that, well, that's just what it is. It's in a textbook and a discussion. But mm -hmm. uh, of course, that's, that's nonsensical. There's plenty of things that have been in uh, textbooks that, uh, you know, came out eventually. Um, so when you're in a, in a so-called fed state, you're, you're in an insulin driven state. So your blood sugar goes up, you eat carbohydrates, your blood sugar goes up, this sparks insulin. And, and so the thought was like, oh, well, this is a normal process process. You know, you, you put in the blood sugar and then your, your insulin goes up and this brings it down. And this is a normal thing. You have this and up and down. And that's meant to happen up. five times a day as you eat your yeah, exactly. five meals throughout the day. Yeah, exactly. And so, Six. you know, because, you know, because we didn't, we didn't know and just everyone who ate food, this is what it looked like. And then after you didn't eat for 24 hours, it switched to this other one. Um, but that that's it. It's quite simplistic. So when you put your, when you, you put in, exogenous uh, carbohydrates when you eat carbohydrates your blood sugar goes up but blood sugar as i you know alluded to earlier causes direct damage to your body so by a process called glycosylation or glycation these glucose molecules physically fuse to other molecules this is, this is part of heart disease where these things fuse onto like sdldl certain types of cholesterol and they make them uh defunct and your liver can't take them up and only their macrophages can take them up and they turn into these big foam cells then you add that to uh arterial wall damage and these things can actually get in there through the cracks of these damage uh, because they're they're that's what they're designed to do they're designed to go in and, and you know fix damage and, and fight bacteria and all of a sudden they just turn into these these bigger and bigger plaques so and there's, there's a whole massive disease process that goes along with it but that's that's some parts mm. so it's not the cholesterol that's a problem it's actually the, the glycation of the of the cholesterol of certain cholesterols that you get when you're eating fructose and, and um, you know, sugar and alcohol so when you're in that state you know blood sugar is is at too high of a level is really bad for you so this this is what kills diabetics just that simple fact that their blood sugar is is up all the time. That's what breaks down their body. That's what gives them, you know, peripheral vascular disease, heart disease, you know, neuro, uh, neurological dysfunction and so forth. Their body just breaks down from the inside out and they, and they have very hard lives if it's not well controlled and that's it. And you control your blood sugar. It's like, you don't have diabetes because it's the blood sugar that's causing harm. Yeah. And so, so the, so am I right in saying these diabetics, they're in the fed state all mm -hmm. the time because they're constantly getting this blood sugar spike from the exogenous, which is exogenous carbohydrates, which is a good way to describe it because, you know, most people would think that carbohydrates can only be exogenous um, that are constantly spiking the blood sugar and then triggering the insulin response. So it's just kind of, it, it, is, am I on the right track there? Yeah. Well, yeah. And then they, you know, you know, most of us that aren't on a carbohydrate carnivore diet or a ketogenic diet are in, 
are in a you know a, you know this fed state and um, and this is where like intermittent fasting comes in because you're just waiting out the clock on the insulin and then your body gets back into its normal state people feel a lot better they can work out more have better exercise tolerance they go run marathons on the on the their fasting day where they don't need anything that mm. day and and so on so they um you know people already see the benefits of being in in what i call our primary metabolic state um and so you know when you you know, when you have you know, high blood sugar and your, your, your insulin is going to be driven up defensively because your body recognizes this is dangerous and is saying, okay, you know, what the hell has this person done? Get that insulin up as quickly as possible. So your insulin slams up insulin blocks something called proteolysis and lipolysis, which are basically the ability for your body to break down proteins and fats in order to, to get energy. Okay. So in layman's terms, it forces energy into cells. It doesn't allow it to come out of cells. And so you are forcing all this energy because you have way too much and your body's like, get this the hell out of here. And so you're just stuffing it in every cell in your body. It goes in the body and into muscle, you know, into muscle and your brain and things like that and different organs that you're using. But it also goes into places that you don't want. It stores it in glycogen, which is fine. You can use that later. And it stores it into fat, intramuscular fat, you know, fat all around your body, but also intramuscular fat. Mm -hmm. And so this is where like marbling on the cow comes from. This is why they give them grain mm -hmm. is to get that intramuscular fat. And so, you know, we're doing that to ourselves. So people who eat carbohydrates and sugar, they, they have marbled muscle and you know some some um bodybuilders and things like that say like, oh you have to eat carbs because it gives you that pump well no not really it gives you excess glycogen and uh retained water and intramuscular fat yeah, so that's not that's not actually healthy it's, it's really helpful if you're trying to just take up as much space as you can right yeah <laughs> you know yeah. rather than necessarily be as strong or as toned or as healthy or you know yeah. have that really tight look if you're just purely yeah. trying to take up space sure go on <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah, well, you know some of these guys you know they 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 do a trip where they they'll eat some carbohydrates and things like that right before their competition and they'll just sort of swell up a bit you know and and if they want to do that that's fine yeah, yeah exactly I, you know, it's exactly. bulking and cutting sort of thing I, I think that's very counterproductive because you're just filling your muscles up with glycogen and fat and mm -hmm. then that just has to go away eventually you know and, and so you just lost it and you're on you're less healthy so that's what that's what it's doing in, in your fed state and you're it's basically you're just in damage control the whole time well you mm. can't any system cannot be in damage control the whole time it's going to start you know falling falling apart at the side so yeah. um when you're in a a you know a fasting state so-called fasting state which i think is our main state that mm. doesn't happen so you know, insulin stays at a very low level just enough to you know keep things working properly but not so much that it shuts down uh your body's uh metabolic working so now you can access your fat stores because when you're when you're in the the, the, the fed state the the carbohydrate state you cannot access your fat stores. very yeah. important point that yeah. everyone should understand yeah so every everything you eat goes into your fat, but now you cannot access your fat stores. So this is like filling up your, your car at the you know, petrol station, gas station, and then just, just putting a cork in it. So it can't go to your, your, your engine. It's like, Oh no, this is, this is just for, you know, when I get lost in the desert or something like that doesn't make any damn sense. You know, your, your fat in your body is your gas tank. You eat food that fills up your gas tank. Now you run on your gas, you know, petrol for whoever's listening. And um, you know, that is what, that is that that's the state that you're in in the so-called fasting state and so now your body can use its energy it can um you know mobilize you know blood sugar glycogen ketones all these sorts of things your brain's major energy source are ketones that's what people think is glucose it's not you do not run on on glucose uh, really when you're in the fasting state uh you always run on ketones your brain always runs on ketones and so this is actually something uh, that's been theorized. There's a guy, uh, Dr. Bickman from um, BYU, who has, a, has an Instagram page, uh, really interesting stuff. You know, he was talking about how, um, you know, Alzheimer's and so forth can actually be, you know, it, it's actually thought of as some people are calling it type three diabetes, which is what I've, I've mentioned in other talks. Um, so more of a me metabolic issue. Uh, that is similar to type two diabetes and so forth. And yeah, you can, you can see this uh, because they have peripheral insulin resistance 
in your brain as well. So you have insulin resistance. Now, you know, your, your body can't get, you know, blood sugar into these cells very well. well can't utilize them very well. Your brain is also part of that. So now your brain's not really running on, uh, on full steam. And so you start slowing down and actually you can have people with these tangles and these plaques that, that are in, indicative of Alzheimer's, but if they don't have the peripheral insulin resistance and so forth, they don't actually get the disease. And so what's more important is your body's inability to get energy into your brain cells. And so when you go into a ketogenic diet, and there've been uh, many studies showing that a high fat ketogenic diet actually is a better treatment modality for Alzheimer's than every other medication that's ever been trialed for Alzheimer's. Okay. And uh, Dr. Bickman, Bickman was, uh, you know, saying that this is, this is because when you go into a ketogenic state, now you switch over to ketones. Now your brain is getting a lot of ketones because your brain wants to run on ketones. It can run on glucose. It wants to run on ketones. Yeah. And I might so, just, might just jump in there that yeah. anyone who's ever experienced ketosis and particularly maybe for the first time, um, it was a pretty extreme experience for me. Uh, yeah. and I feel like, you know, you sort of, you tap into, it's like that movie limitless with, um, Bradley Cooper mm. and you've just got like this epic energy and you're running nice and smooth and, uh, and you can concentrate and just keep on chugging. Um, yeah. so yeah, I totally agree with you. The, if people want to be successful, you should be in the, in the a state of ketosis more, um, which is, uh, is similar to this, what we're calling a fasted state, which it sounds like, you know, doctors talk about it as if like, you know, oh, you could rarely, you could occasionally enter a fasted state, yeah. you know, before a surgery or something, or, you know, um, maybe do intermittent fasting. But the reality yeah. is that you could be in this fasted state all the time. Well, you're supposed to be. I you're think. supposed to be, yeah. 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 Well, you look, you look at all animals in the wild, like, I mean, almost all of them, they're, they're all in this ketogenic starvation state. Like, okay. So, you know, and, and people that don't really understand this to just look at biochemistry and say, Oh, fed state, fasting state. And just, and just, you know, there's, there's always a thing is like, you know, uh, you can think outside the box, you know, the box is, you know, uh, you know, heretofore, um, you know, prescribed, you know, knowledge, right. So we're saying this is in this box is fed state, fasting state. Okay. You think outside the box and say, well, actually it works better. If you flip those two around. You know, and say and say that the fasting state is actually a primary state, and the fed state is actually a pathological defense mechanism. Your body trying to protect you from from hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. um, there's one one more point about the um, you know the so-called fed state. Um, you're you're throwing energy into cells. You can't allow it to come out of cells. You can't access your fat cells. But it does something more insidious, which is it blocks a hormone called leptin, which I've spoken about before. Leptin uh, is released from your stretch receptors in your stomach. So when you eat a big meal, it stretches out, it releases leptin, your body goes, oh, I'm full. But the majority of it comes from your fat cells. And so this actually tells your brain how much fat that you have, how much energy you have in the tank. And so when you're eating these sorts of things, insulin goes up, insulin blocks leptin. And now your brain can't see it's left in, it doesn't know how much energy it has. Mm, yeah. And so it thinks that you're hungry. And now your blood sugar is dropping because your insulin stays up for about 24 hours. And again, you can't mobilize energy when your insulin is up. So now your blood sugar is dropping, your brain can't see it's left in. So you get a signal that you have zero energy reserves and your blood sugar is dropping and your brain sends out a panic signal that says, if you don't eat now, you will die. And this is why three times a day, people go, oh my God, I'm starving. And they're, and they're panicked. You know, you see these you know, funny videos on, on the internet and things like that of someone just freaking out, screaming, like, I want, you know, Taco Bell, whatever it is. And they're just losing their mind. I haven't eaten in 12 hours. <laughs> they're losing their mind. And it's funny because like, they're obviously not starving to death, but they're so panicked and they're so emotional because their brain really is sending them a signal that they will die without food. And that's very distressing. And this is what causes people to overeat because they don't have a natural stop mechanism. Whereas in carnivore or ketogenic, you, have, you, have, you naturally stop because you know, meat stops tasting good when your body doesn't want it. Your body recognizes my brain can see it's leptin and so forth and things, it tastes better, meat tastes better when it wants the, that energy. And then at a certain point, you know, it's, it's the best thing. That's why when I, first I started eating a steak, it's the best damn thing I've ever eaten in my life, every single day. It never gets tired. Some people say, oh, oh, don't you get bored of that? Never. Because 
by definition, when I'm hungry, that's going to taste good. And so it tastes amazing at first, amazing, 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 really good, good. It's okay. It's all right. And I get to a point where I just go like, you know, I'm really not enjoying this anymore. And I naturally want to stop. So it's natural portion control that you have if your brain can see your leptin, that you don't have that when you're eating carbohydrates and so forth. So people talk about, you know, fasting and how beneficial this is. And there, there are plenty of studies that show that. Um, and, you know, for, for all sorts of different reasons. And then they say, oh, well, a ketogenic diet and a carnivore diet, well, this just mimics fasting. And so you get the benefit, you, know, you, get, you mimic some of the, the benefits of fasting. That's all it is. It's just fasting. Fasting is really good for you. And you're just mimicking fasting. Um, or fasting gets rid of this poison that's really bad for you and mimics your, your evolved metabolic state that you're supposed to be in at all times anyway. And because we call this a fasting state, because we think of this as a stress state, which it's not, you know, if you're, if you're starving, you're in a stress state, but if you're just in that metabolism, that's not a stress state because you're, you're, you're not stressed. Your body's eating, you're, you're getting nutrients and so forth. Um, because they just don't think about it and they're, they're still thinking within the box and they probably haven't even learned about the box because most people who talk about this sort of stuff have never taken biochemistry. And so they don't know what they're talking about. Um, they, you know, they think, well, this must be a starvation state. This is a stress state. And so, you know, this, this can't be good long-term, you know, you can't do that. And so, you know, you're, and I've heard, you know, one, one guy say, you know, this is, this is your body is just tricking your body into thinking it's starving to death and then getting the benefits of, well, starving to death. And I was like, you tell me one benefit of starving to death, except you're now dead and I don't have to listen to this nonsense anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That was and, a whole mumbo jumbo. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. And so it's just like, you know, you get um, this thing, you're getting benefits of, you know, of, of being in a starvation state. Well, no, fasting puts you into the metabolism you're supposed to be in. So this is the metabolism we're supposed to be in. We have other studies too. Um, there was uh, actually to do with diabetics. There was a study with, with animal models, basically showing that again, fasting was very beneficial and that for fasting for a number of days, the longer, the better, you know, within, within, you know, uh, you know, within reason. But if you were able to fast these animals for at least four days a month, you could actually significantly reverse and pull back on type two diabetes as well as type one diabetes. So you get better control, obviously the type two diabetics are going to get the same results you would from a ketogenic or, or, or a carnivore metabolism or even just fasting, because uh, this is, this is helps reverse uh, peripheral insulin resistance, normalize your blood sugars. And, and just essentially it's giving your body a break from the poison that's causing the problem. And that's really what's doing it. And your body's just getting back to normal. Um, but very interestingly, they found that they were, that some of the animals could actually regrow their beta islet cells in their pancreas and actually start producing insulin again, which is not something that we thought was going to be possible. Now, this was only in animal models, but um, I think they're trialing this in, in human models. But because they said that, well, fasting gives these benefits, but you know, fasting for four days in a row, that's really hard for people to do. That's not really nice. And so they came up with this fasting mimicking diet. So this is a diet that mimics fasting, basically a ketogenic diet, carnivore diet. <laughs> And so this tricks your body into thinking it's fasting and then you get these benefits from fasting. But, you know, if you're eating something that provides all these massive, massive benefits, maybe you should stop and think and say, maybe that's what we're supposed to be eating all the time. Maybe that's what we evolved on. Maybe biologically, that's what we should be eating. And maybe biologically, these other things are causing harm because you remove those from your diet you don't get the harm anymore. I, I, I don't know how to make it more simple than that. That's really straightforward. And so they do this fasting mimicking diet and they find they, they get the same results. So again, this is, this is further evidence that this is really just how we're supposed to be eating. This is the biochemical state that we should be in all the time. And that the closer you get to our biological heritage, which is a carnivore heritage, 
the, the better you're going to be, better you're going to be, the healthier you're going to be. Carbohydrates and sugar, absolutely some of the worst in the world. But you know, you can be on ketogenics and still eat a bunch of plants that have you know toxic elements because they don't want you to eat them. And so they're trying to deter you. And so they're trying to make you unwell. And so obviously getting closer and closer and closer to carnivore, you know, the better you're going to be, but simply for the, for discussions of diabetes, just getting into a keto, doing a ketogenic diet will significantly help you. Yeah. Wow. Okay. There's, there's a lot there. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and somewhat sort of simplify it. Hopefully I'm, I'm on the right track. Uh, but a, a regular diet where you're eating a lot of carbohydrates spikes your um, glucose level, you get an insulin response. If, you, if people do this too much, that causes or brings on type 2 diabetes. And it's been proven in studies that fasting or a fasted state can you know, reduce the, uh, the symptoms and actually reverse type 2 diabetes. The, uh, the hidden truth is that a carnivore diet or some form of ketogenic diet is actually also now considered a fasted state, which it's clearly not because you're eating, um, yeah. but because it's not spiking your glucose and then you don't get the insulin response, it's called a, a fasted state. So nice. really you can get the benefits of fasting or the so-called benefits which have been shown in these animals who had to fast for four days which is hard yakka i've never done that um Mm -hmm. you know i I don't think most people would enjoy doing that uh you can get those same benefits by just simply not eating carbohydrates and not eating plants that have toxic chemicals in them Um, and therefore you know you're going to function better and you can actually reverse type 2 diabetes is it is yeah. that more or less yeah yeah right? yeah and, and i would i would sort of say as well you know uh you know going keto or carnivore saying that gets the benefits of fasting i, I would i would say the other way around that fasting yeah. gives you the benefits of being on a ketogenic carnivore diet really mm. uh, it, from a metabolic state being being the right metabolic um frame i mean if you want to endure a four-day fast by all means <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. But, well, I, yeah, and that's fine. Some people do. I mean, I don't. I don't recommend fasting if you're on a carnivore diet. You don't. You don't need to. You yeah. just listen to your body. Your body will naturally limit uh, calories for what you're doing. You know, when I when I was back on this, um, you know, last sort of four or five years, I at first had had excess uh, fat. So I wasn't massive, but I definitely had had you know weight I could lose. And so I, I ate much less because I just, even though I was working out like crazy, I was back, you know, playing rugby and lifting weights very heavily um, because I, I could, again, I, I just felt amazing. Um, you know, I was eating a lot less than I am now, even just to maintain. And that's because my body wanted to use my fat first. So it knew that it was there. It saw the leptin and said, no, 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 we don't need all that much. And so I was eating much less and I felt weird about it, you know, first, because I was, I, I felt I was like, well, I just worked out, you know, I just did a three hour gym session and a three hour rugby session. Like, you know, I'm going to be doing the same thing tomorrow. So like, I, I really need to eat. I hadn't eaten that whole day, but everything in me was saying like steak just doesn't sound good right now. And you know what I tell people like if the steak doesn't taste good. That means you're not hungry. And I learned this myself firsthand. And I was like, well, I should, I should eat because you know, that's what you think of I, mean, I need to eat today so I can use that energy tomorrow. You need, you know, carbs to burn carbs wrong. You have a gas tank. My gas tank was full. I didn't need to, to fill it up anymore. Um, so everything just sounded like, oh, I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat. But I was like, oh, I should really eat something. So I, I took a long time to cook it, did like a reverse sear in the oven, like took a couple hours, just took my time with it. And eventually I was just like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess I could kind of, you know, eat something. So I started eating. I got, I don't know, a quarter of the way into this steak, amazing ribeye steak, which is beautiful. And I just thought to myself, I was like, I really I'm just not enjoying this. I just want to stop. And so I did put it away, did my whole workout the next day, felt fine. Then came back and I had my my steak there. It's dry. It's cold. It's hard. And it tasted absolutely amazing. It was unbelievable how good that thing was, you know, and that, and that's the power of taste. And that's what you should, should listen to that. And so my body was telling me, this is how many calories you need. This is how much nutrition you need. Stop. And, you know, and, and so it was, it's, it's perfect. And so, you know, when you're eating like that, your body just works so much better and you can fast uh, and you achieve the same metabolic state, but, but you don't have to, and it's not, it's not important to, if you're eating a carnivore diet, 
mm-hmm. because your body will just naturally limit the what um, you know the caloric intake anyway. How hungry you are. Yeah, there's there's something deceptive when it comes to satiety with carbohydrates. Um, and you, yeah. you you don't realize that until you start experimenting with a carnivore or a ketogenic diet uh, and you start to discover that hey um if you actually eat too many eggs that last egg your body's just going to say uh-uh i ain't yeah. eating this this isn't pleasant or um and it's the same with steak like you said or yeah. like when i have you know homemade like beef mince or anything like that like you just know straight away like I ain't enjoying this anymore i'm putting it back in the fridge i've had enough whereas you compare that to like a bowl of cereal um or you compare that to eating cake or nutella or all this sort of stuff you really can keep going and because the flavors can be so different as well um and your body just says yeah i'll have more ice cream or i'll have more whatever it is that's really sweet it's um yeah Yeah. interesting yeah i i see that with um my patients as well um who are trying to lose weight and and they've obviously you know had you know, portion control issues. And, and I, I think that, I don't think that that's quite fair. They don't, they don't have portion control issues. I think they, they just didn't know how to manage their own portions is that they're eating carbohydrates and sugar, and that's deranging their, their hunger signals and so forth. So they don't, they don't realize how much they need. And, and when they've gone past that, mm. so it's really not their fault. Um, you know, there's other people just like, they're just hungry all the time and miserable and just, just hate their life, you know, and, and other people choose not to, to live like that. And, um, but when I get them on a, or on a carnivore diet, I always explain to them their hunger signals, hunger signals are going to be very different and that they should use taste as their measure. And if a steak doesn't taste good, they're not hungry, but if it does taste good, they are. And so they should listen to that and eat meat when it tastes good until it stops tasting as good. And, you know, and you naturally just want to stop. I, I try to explain that to people because I, I've run into this issue, but there's always, there's always a few that sort of don't take that to heart. And I see them in a couple of weeks and some of them will and I'll ask them, how's it going? And they're like, I hate it. I hate this. I hate eating meat. It's just horrible. I'm just not enjoying this. I just hate it. And, and you can tell they've come into the office looking for a fight and they're just like, Ugh, and like, I want to get off this. <laughs> so I just ask them, you know, it's like, okay, well, does it always taste bad? Like even at first, like, uh, when you first start the meal, does it taste bad then? And they go, well, no, at first it tastes really good, but I get halfway through and just tastes horrible. And I have to force feed myself for two hours to finish the meal. And, you know, then I, of course, explain to them, well, that's, that was your body telling you that that's all you need. You know, because when you tell people you can eat as much as you want, the operative word, word there is want. You know, when it starts to stop tasting good, and you're forced feeding yourself, you clearly don't want to eat anymore. And so they make this big old thing. That's a, that's a portion size that they're used to eating and say, oh, that's what I'll eat today. You get halfway through and, and you start hating it. Well, that's as much as you wanted, you know, and, or at least that's as much as your body wanted. And so it's, uh, it's very important to, to look at it that way, but you know, we get the opposite problem with people that are quite skinny and underweight because they've had, they've had the other problem. They've been basically starving themselves with people with, with, uh, you know, eating disorders, bulimia, anorexia, and so forth. They don't eat enough and their, and their hunger signals are very different. So they never feel hungry anymore. So they go, Oh, I just don't need to eat. And so they end up not eating enough and, and getting problems from that. I had that problem when I first started because I just didn't realize that, you know, what, that my hunger signals would change so much because I, w- I was doing this 20 plus years ago. And I, all I was doing was just not eating plants because I knew plants had, had harmful chemicals. And I didn't want them in my body. And I was inadvertently doing a pure carnivore diet. And I, you know, I wasn't eating for days at a time while going to university full time and training in, in high level rugby, seven hours a day, eight hours a day. And I, I wouldn't eat for three, four days in a row. Why, why was that? Because you didn't, you didn't I just didn't realize it. You know, I, I had, I was very time poor. And so I would get up in the morning and I would go straight to uh, classes at university of Washington. And then straight from class, I'd go to uh, my university rugby uh, university of Washington rugby practice that that started at three 30. And then as soon as I finished that, I went to my, my senior uh, training for with, with Seattle, um, Seattle Saracens. 
and would train until, you know, nine o'clock at night. And sometimes I'd go to the gym after that. And so, you know, that was a lot of training and, and I didn't really have much time. And then I had to go home and I had to, you know, study and read and things like that, or, you know, go to the gym. And so maybe I'm getting home at like 11 you know, sometimes 12 and I had to be up early in the morning to go to class again. And so often I would just be like, well, I don't have time to eat. I wouldn't feel hungry. So I just drink a bunch of water and then pass out. Um, every now and then I would, you know, come home a bit earlier. I, I uh, you know, would have managed my time a little better or finished the workout earlier. And I would, um, I would sit there and be like, oh, I, you know, I, I have like 45 minutes before I need to, to go to bed. I should, you know, I have time to cook. And I was like, yeah, and I should eat something because I didn't eat yesterday. And I was like, yeah, and I don't think I ate the day before that. And I was like, did I eat the day before that? And I'm like, okay, well, I really need to eat something then because like I've not been eating enough. And I noticed this as I was going along. I was like, I'm really not eating enough. I'm really barely eating any calories, but I just never felt hungry. And so it was just, you know, I was, I was listening to that. And, you know, people on the other side listen to it and eat too much, but, you know, I was, I had, I had the other problem. So I ended up, I ended up getting, um, undernourished and I got to the point where I, I started actually, uh, you know, feeling worse the more I worked out because I just, my, my body had just run out of its stores and it was just like, now it's causing harm by working out. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I sort of started eating more after that, but, you know, it was, it was a while there that I just wasn't eating enough. And so then I have, you know, patients and, and, you know, friends and just people I talk to that get on this. And if they're quite underweight, they tend to eat very little. And so I, I try to tell them, if you're feeling a bit off, you're feeling a bit tired or, or something's just not right. Think to yourself, does this mean I'm hungry? Am I hungry? Try eating meat or eggs. If that tastes good, that means you're hungry and you need to eat until it stops tasting, tasting good. And then you can relearn your hunger signal. Now I know when I'm hungry or when I'm not, it, it's, it's very easy for me to tell, but I couldn't then. And, and most people can't either. Yeah. First. That's interesting. That's interesting. The hunger, the hunger receptors, because yeah. it is a, you know, it's a different feeling. It's not, uh, my blood sugar is crashing. Oh my God, I'm hangry. You know, I need a mm. sneakers. It's, um, yeah, yeah, it's, I'm running low on energy. Something doesn't feel quite right here. I don't feel like doing any training, you know, <clears throat> just something's off totally different. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's um, I'm just gonna just gonna jump just mention one thing too. Um, you know, when you're talking about training, you're talking about metabolism and all these sorts of things. Insulin plays a big role in this. Um, it, you know, it's, it's an anabolic uh, substance, so it causes you to store energy into cells, make those cells grow. And so sometimes people take this stuff in order to force that reaction, which I don't. I, don't, I think is very counterproductive. Um, but we see this in, you know, type one diabetics where they, they stop making insulin. So their insulin levels are zero. Their metabolism is like 20% higher, 25% higher. So it runs faster. So they lose a lot of weight. That's one of the first signs of someone who has type one diabetes is that they're peeing a lot. That's what diabetes means. It means you pee a lot. Diabetes mellitus. That's what this is. It means it tastes sweet. So because you're, you're peeing out a lot of blood sugar because your body can't use it. Um, either because you're resistant to insulin or because you don't, you don't produce insulin. And, and I, I swear to God, doctors actually would taste pee in order to figure out <laughs> if it was diabetes mellitus or insipidus. And that's, that's, a um, job. yeah, that's not, not a job for me anyway. And um, so they lose a lot of weight. One reason obviously being is because they can't utilize their blood sugar. Uh, but also it's because they jacked up their metabolism and metabolic rate. And when you get people on insulin, that their metabolism actually normalizes and it goes back to, to what it's supposed to be. Now, think of the converse of this. Now you have a uh, type two diabetic who is chronically hyperglycemic and hyperinsulinemic. So their insulin levels really high all the time. That's going to really suppress their metabolism and their, their body's ability to utilize energy because it's saying store energy, store energy, okay. store energy, store energy. And so, you know, this is why you can, you can get the sort of the two pronged attack. You're getting peripheral insulin resistance that, that goes along with weight gain. You don't, it doesn't have to be, there are you know, a significant proportion of people that are metabolically unwell. It's sort of the, the skinny fat people that, that, um, that 
still have metabolic syndrome, but are normal weight. Mm-hmm. Um, but if this, this does go hand in hand, it slows down your metabolism. You're not able to utilize energy as well. You're not able to work out as hard. You're not able to, to lose weight as well because of this, uh, uh, high insulin state. So that's, that's something to consider too. Um, you know, it is, this is another added benefit of getting onto you know, a carnivore diet and so forth is that you're going to normalize your insulin, which is going to normalize and, and in most people speed up your metabolism. This is also important for heart disease as well. This is something that I was in a debate just a few days ago with uh, ACNAM, the Australian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, we had a panel of uh, very famous cardiologists and then me for some reason. And um, yeah, very, very uh, honored to be amongst all these people because they're very, very, um, esta- very well established and internationally renowned people. And, um, and you know, one of, the, one of the major themes that that was brought up there was that the people that we argued that cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease and we need to rethink what we're doing here. We won that debate quite handily. And one of the things that my colleagues were, were saying was this, this really is more to do with high insulin states and this, you know, being in a, in a hyperinsulinemic state that this is actually a driver of, of uh, heart disease state and so forth. And that has, has to do with a lot of things, but you know, think about it, your insulin's up that's because your blood sugar is up and your blood sugar is causing glycation to all these cholesterol molecules and so forth. And it helps drive this disease process. So there, there are a lot of benefits to going on a carnivore diet, you know, metabolically reversing diseases, you know, preventing heart disease and so forth, you know, weight loss and, and just feeling good all the time. It, it makes such an impact in your life. Just that, that simple difference of eating carbohydrates, not eating carbohydrates changes everything. Mm. And so this is why, you know, I tell people that like, you know, the last 5% of going pure has about 95% of the benefits, because if you're eating a little bit of carbs, that's going to be enough to jack your insulin up and stuff up your metabolism for an entire day. And so if you're eating low carb, a lot of people that eat low carb, depending on how low it is, if it's not low enough, they end up feeling rotten because they can't produce energy and they're not, they're not eating enough carbohydrates to make them feel good at all. So, um, it's definitely, uh, something that I advise people against doing if you're just going to go, you know, completely without carbs, uh, if they're going to, to make the jump. Yeah. That's an interesting perspective. It's something that we should dive into on, on a, a whole other topic, um, which is kind of like that metabolic flexibility. Um, I, I totally agree in terms of the experimentation and feeling and experiencing what you feel like running on zero carbohydrates, uh, because, if it, if it works for you, I mean, it's, it is fantastic. You, you feel great with energy and, and you, know, yeah. you just want to get more done. Um, all right, Dr. Chafee, to sort of wrap things up, as I said at the start, in America, one in 10 people have diabetes. Uh, in Australia, one in 20, so slightly lower. But chances are you will know someone who mm. is suffering from diabetes or you might be suffering from diabetes yourself. Do you have a, a, a little bit of advice for them? Yeah, I think that I think that it's vitally important to at least go on a ketogenic diet, especially if you're someone who suffers from from diabetes or is pre diabetic or has family members that are diabetic, because type two diabetes, um, you know, may be more, uh, you know, there may be a genetic component to that, and people are more susceptible uh, to that. So if it runs in your family, that that could be an issue. Uh, But it's going to be better for everyone. If you get away from carbohydrates and sugar, um, you know, we were talking about, you know, in America around 10, I think it's like 9% of people in America are diabetic. Those people account for 75% of the Medicare uh, costs in America. Okay. So that it's a huge burden of disease. Bloody it's hell. extremely expensive. It has all these problems that, uh, you know, are precipitated from them. Lots, of, uh, we, lots of opportunity for pharmaceutical companies there. <laughs> Sorry, lots of opportunity for pharmaceutical companies. Well, yeah, exactly. And so, and this is why I'm looking stat. for pharmaceuticals to help, you know, mitigate this disease as opposed to figuring out how the hell to get rid of it, which is what I'm trying to do. And, you know, so when you consider that that that's already taking up that huge burden of of cost on the healthcare system of of every country, um, and it just in America, nine percent account for seventy five percent of the Medicare costs, right? Now we realize that 40% of Americans, of the other Americans, of the rest of the population 
are pre-diabetic. Okay, so ostensibly, if they don't change what they're doing, and you know, if if things remain as they are, they won't. Uh, in a decade or so, you could have nearly half the population of America being a diabetic, and now having to incur all these costs. A lot of these, a lot of these costs come from people being a diabetic for a long time and they break down slowly. So it's not going to be like you go diabetic, bam, you have this really expensive thing to treat, but um, eventually it, you, you know, this is, this is accounting for 75% of the budget. And now you have, you know, you've quintupled your disease burden. You know, what's that going to do? I mean, that, that is uh, a major, major factor in healthcare crises because a lot of them, one of the major crises in, in healthcare is funding this. So whatever, whatever system you think is going to be best, I certainly have my own opinions. Whatever it is, if you keep increasing the disease burden, a very, very costly disease, it's just going to run out of control. And when you, if you can just reverse that by having people not do something, I mean, what's cheaper than not eating something extra? You know, you're actually saving money. And so you not do that. And now all of a sudden this disease goes away and that significantly reduces the disease burden in the country. And, and it makes these people's lives so much better. Like it, I don't care who you are, um, you know, living with diabetes is not fun. And, and, you know, maybe people like cake more than they like living without diabetes. That's, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a few of those, yeah, but that's their choice. They, but if they, you know, didn't have to, a lot of people don't want to, a lot of people don't want to live with diabetes. And if they had the option, like my mom did, who's a big foodie, she loves cooking, loves all these things. It was very hard for her at first, but she had such a great outcome with her blood sugar control and coming off medications that she said, okay, well, this is just what I have to do now. I, I, there's just no two ways about it. And so having that as an option for people, I think is uh, just very important and to at least think about and consider and understand this is the disease process this is the toxicity process this is why it's happening and this is what you can expect if you keep going down that path yeah yeah i absolutely agree i mean what do you have to lose if you're yeah. suffering or you're looking or you're looking to avoid suffering from type 2 diabetes the ketogenic diet's been proven to help the carnivore diet's going to be even more effective yeah the science is there give it a crack. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've been treating diabetes type one and type two since the 1800s with a ketogenic yeah, diet. Yeah. This stuff isn't new. That's the other thing. This yeah. isn't a breakthrough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we just, we're just sort of rediscovering what everyone knew for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, that was a great chat. Um, all about diabetes. Thanks Dr. Chafee. You were on today. Um, no problem. Appreciate yeah. it. Till next time. Absolutely.